Hello and welcome to episode 144 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. And I'm James Willingham. Welcome. This week, Lyft will incentivize drivers who drive EVs by paying them extra weekly fees. And they're also considering throwing in a free vomit shield for late night rides. Turns out the laser used in last week's fusion energy breakthrough was also used as a set in Star Trek. I'm glad to see the scientific community helping out Star Trek, but where they really need help is with the script writing. Tokyo mandates solar on all new buildings. Unfortunately for their tiny hotel suites, this only requires a solar panel the size of the ones you find on calculators. The U.S. Postal Service commits to 100% electric vehicles. Now your package will arrive with a lower carbon footprint. However, it'll still be late. Plus, we'll have stories on the chip shortage not going away, and why Americans should buy an EV in the next two months, and solar on an abandoned nuclear power plant site. All that and more on this special year-end edition of The Clean Energy Show. Yes, I would like to call this the year-end spectacular. That's how it's going to be. Okay, the year-end spectacular of The Clean Energy Show. <laughs> yeah, which basically means we're going to go long this week. Okay. Brian, we're late this week. Why are we late, yep. Brian? Why are we many days late? Why are our fans craving our show and unable to get their fix of the clean energy show until now? Yes. Well, I have a long story to tell about uh, travel, winter travel here in the wilds of uh, Western Canada. So I had, we were going to be one day late for the podcast because uh, I was traveling, but it ended up to be uh, several days late. But uh, yeah, we had a lovely trip to Jasper, Alberta, Canada, which is in uh, the Rocky Mountains of Canada. Um, it's an absolutely beautiful place. Have you been to Jasper? I, I've camped at Jasper at uh, Pocahontas uh, Campground in the north, and I've been through there. It is probably, um, well, the locals like it better than Banff because it's yeah. just less touristy. But yeah. it, it's also known for its highway in the winter being shut down due to dynamiting <laughs> avalanches. You know, it's not an easy, they call it the um, Ice Fields Highway or Parkway, rather. Yeah, well, that's the thing. It is less touristy because it's harder to get to. Like Banff is quite close to Calgary, but Jasper is an almost a four-hour drive from Edmonton, which is the closest uh, major city. So, you know, we were talking, re you know, recently in France, they have sort of ban some short haul flights because those can be covered by trains and, you know, we need to all be flying less. Um, but yeah, we had to make this calculation of how to get there because it's a, like an eight hour drive to Edmonton and then a four hour drive to Jasper. So if we drove it, that's 12 hours. It's a bit too long. Mm -hmm. um, everyone else in my family has things to do like, you know, exams and they're not you know, retired. I'm retired. Yeah. You're I'm just the a only retired one. old man. You could, you could do whatever <laughs> the hell you want. Yeah, but we thought, well, we better fly and that'll save us a couple of days because people have things to do. So you fly to Edmonton, you rent a car, you drive that to uh, Jasper. So that worked fairly well on the way there, although it was starting to get cold and our flight was delayed a couple of hours out of Regina. So, you know, it, it was kind of slow to get there. Yeah. Uh, but we picked up the rental car, and I wanted to talk a bit about that, too, because, you know, obviously we talk about EVs a lot on the show, and we love EVs, and you and I, we're in it, though, a bit of a EV bubble, like, that tends to be all we think about and, and talk about. But um, I just wanted to say, I sort of, you know, sometimes you forget the niceties of a, just a really nice car. So we, there was four of us, so we got this large Kia Sorento SUV. It's a seven-seater uh, SUV, this Ooh. very big vehicle. And uh, it was great, you know, like it, it, it I made me think like, you know, obviously EVs are the way to go and we're obviously transitioning to EVs, but you can kind of understand why somebody would get into a Kia Sorento and think, yeah, this is fine. We don't need an, we don't need an EV. This works great. You know, it's a brand new car. Um, only took half a tank of gas on all the way to Jasper. Really? even though it was like this this large SUV. Um, yeah, everything worked great on it. I mean, contrast a couple of months ago, we rented a Toyota Corolla for something, and that was less good. I don't know, you know, Toyota Corolla. <laughs> it's, it's an inexpensive car, so you get what you pay for, but I was kind of surprised how crappy it was. I used to admire Corollas all my life. Yeah. <laughs> I used to admire the, the car my son has, which is a Honda 
on his well, Civic, like 20 years old, I would have admired that, you know, because it's I've yeah. had these really crappy cars <laughs> in my life. But I did rent one. I did rent a uh, Corolla when we had we hit a deer a number of years ago. Yeah. And I was thinking, eh, you know, this isn't... Uh, no. You know, because the Corolla and the Prius, the cost of ownership is is equal or better for the Prius. So if you just spend the extra money and get yeah. the Prius, you get so much more. Yeah. And then you you pay that much less in gas and, and, and everything. Yeah. So, yeah, I, uh, I I recommend you think about the, the cost of ownership when you buy a car. Yeah. And, yeah, more up front for the Prius, but probably cheaper in, in the long run. And then we ended up renting a Toyota RAV4 for the drive home, which I'll, I'll explain that in a bit. But so then we had another experience with another car, a brand new RAV4. And that was decent, although I could never hook up the... Do Toyotas even have, like, CarPlay, Apple CarPlay, or...? Uh, that's a good question, because they've avoided that. They, I will say, though, that the ones that that got into it do have the Apple and not the Android, but now they have both. Right? But that surprises me, because I would have thought all new Toyotas got, yeah. have both now. But it, Let, was it uh, older? No, no, it was brand new. But, really? like, on the Kia Sorento... It, the Apple CarPlay hooked up right away. It was great, so we were able to use Google Maps on the on the navigation. The Toyota, it said something about you got to download the Toyota app to connect with your car. Oh, and I was like, oh, what? Toyota. Okay, so, this so this I isn't, did that, this is, and then this it was like, shows you what they're like, man, with the with the <laughs> EVs. This is indicative and, of everything they do. And they're just kind of slow to change. The other thing we noticed was like we were driving away from the rental place in the in the Rav Four. And we were like, oh, wait, did we forget the keys? Where are the keys? Where's the key fob? Maybe we drove away without the key fob. And then after five minutes of looking, we realized it was in the ignition. You have to put it in the ignition and turn the key. <laughs> did they it start was, it for you and you just got in? They did. They uh, started did it for us the way the world in. used to work? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is actually kind of nice. It's kind of nice to actually have a place to put the key. Sure. But also, my knee was bumping against it, wow. and uh, it just seemed super old timey. Yeah. But this, so I did download this app that Toyota wanted me to download, and then it was like, okay, set up your account with Toyota in order oh. to connect. And I'm like, what? And then you needed like a VIN number, or it's it said you could uh, like a type, QR code, uh, GNA profile, <laughs> DNA profile. And it said that you can shoot like a, there's a VR code or a, a QR code on the screen, but I couldn't get the QR code. And then they were like, okay, enter the VIN number. And at that point, I, I gave up. <laughs> so um, so anyway, the Kia Sorento really loved it. It was great. But you still got those gasoline car negatives, which is by the time we got to Jasper. And so, by the way, like the weather, the day before the wedding, so we were there for my, my sister-in-law was getting married. Uh, she got she got married to an F-18 fighter pilot guy. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't do that anymore, but... Oh, okay. That's good. Because, <laughs> you know, we yeah. only have like six F-18s in the Canadian military, and they may well, go off somewhere. And why it's kind of a big deal, you yeah. know? So, it's uh, a, yeah, it is a big deal. They're, they're the elite of the elite when the... Yeah, if there's only sure. six of them or something yeah, like that. Yeah, but uh, so congratulations to Alex and Dan. Lovely wedding. And the day before the wedding, so this was going to be an outdoor wedding. This was their plan, an really? outdoor wedding in Jasper in the middle of the winter because it's, it's cool. It's beautiful. Was there an F-18 flying over, you know, no, with colored uh, dye coming out of it <laughs> or smoke? But the day before the wedding, it was minus five Celsius and sunny. Like it was perfect the uh, day before the wedding. Really? And then the day of the wedding, it dropped to minus 20 and windy. So the wedding could not be held outdoors. We had to go to the backup location uh, in the, the Jasper Park Lodge and, and have it uh, indoors. But um, so, yeah, it got super frigid, you know, midway through the trip. So, you know, starting up the Kia Sorento, it started fine and everything, but it was just took so long to warm up. Like gas cars just take so long to warm up. Yeah. Um, you know, we went into Jasper to fill it up with gas and, you know, it's, it's like people say, you know, one of the advantages of gas cars is they're so quick to fill up, but I got to tell you when it's minus 40, it does not feel quick. <laughs> Nothing feels quick at minus 40 and when you you're know, filling up an SUV. Yeah. With the Tesla, if we'd had the Tesla and by the way, there's Tesla superchargers on main street in Jasper. There wasn't before, but there is now. There wasn't before. 
you know, you you would hop out of the car, plug it in, get back in your car. And that's in like all you less... do, by the way, people. Yeah. When you own a that's Tesla, you it knows your car, knows your account. That's, yeah. What's that called? It's, it's um, sort of, well, I, I forget the, the term for it. People are it's yelling It's all connected, but you just have to plug it in and you can get back in your car. Yeah. But, you know, filling it up with gas, it's minus 40 out. I mean, it was like minus 30 something and windy. So it was, you know, and you're fumbling with the credit card and the gas pump. No, and, yeah, and it, you know. the, the, I, the shell that I go to, and then I haven't done this in a long time, thank Jesus, is I used to fill up the car at a shell station, and it was so slow. Every step, <laughs> yeah. would you like a car wash? Yes, no. <laughs> would you like to enter your air miles? Yes, yeah. no. And it didn't come up quickly, and then with the colder it was, the longer it took for the LCT screen to display. Yeah, the displays on the pump are always kind of half frozen. Ah, and, no. And then got... God forbid something goes wrong with your credit card and you have to do it again or yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. So um, I really wanted to uh, have the supercharging experience there. So um, a, a, mix, a mixed bag, but, you know, it, it's, a, it's a great car and you can see why people, like aside from the pollution, like a new car like that works fantastic. You know, if it wasn't for the pollution, there would be kind of no re reason to change it. it. You know, it worked great. Was it smooth? Was it... Um... Uh, it was the engine was a bit noisy, I would say, but you know, other than that, smooth and you know decent power, good cruise control, good lane keep. Uh, uh, Hyundai's got good uh, like automated. You put on the cruise control, and then it's got lane keep that keeps you in the lanes. Very similar to Tesla. Uh, the Toyota lane keep did not seem to really work. It was more of a thing where if you drifted over to the line, it would beep and yeah, yeah, and, you know, yeah. Well, that's a yeah. it's 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 like a lane keep warning. Now, that's what we have in yeah. our car, is yeah. it's to keep you from falling asleep and going to oncoming yeah. traffic is what it's designed to do, and it will steer you back into the yeah. middle. But it's not meant for helping no. you drive, really. It's just meant for emergencies. No. And I even sort of tried to trigger it a couple of times, and it wouldn't even trigger. Like really? I, maybe it thought I was changing lanes or purposely going into the ditch or something. Yeah, but. yeah. If you if you're signaling. Um, bypasses it and if you f sometimes if you forcefully do it you know it knows you're doing it on purpose and yeah. and doesn't and bypasses at least in my car which i'm sure that my, my car is actually coming up on six years old so yeah um that will be uh probably improved although i'm, I'm sure toyota has some sort of um you know driving thing but you know what did you think of the the rav4 uh, other than that the rav4 was was nice it was uh just a but you, you same. would think though that um, you know Toyota would want rental car places to do to buy their cars by the hundreds of thousands, yeah. And yet this is the experience that rental car people get: get the Toyota app, do this, do that. That's BS, yeah. man. It's total no, stupidity. That, that made it no sense. Like it, it uh, you know, you want to hop in a rental car and be able to use it right away. And, you know, things like, you know, you're always fumbling, oh, where's the lever for the gas, release the gas thing? And on the Hyundai, there wasn't one. You just opened the thing and it just worked. Uh, on the Toyota, you kind of had to look for it. But yeah, you want to be able to just hop in a, a rental car and have it work. And uh, So you know. basically you couldn't get a flight back for, what is it, 45 an hour uh, flight from away from yeah. us? It's a, it's a one hour flight. And so then on the way back, we drove the, the Kia Sorento back to Edmonton. We went to the airport and uh, this was, yeah, the, the cold weather was starting to set in and on the West coast, there's been blizzards and stuff. So, you know, Vancouver had it worse, probably Seattle as well, um, where massive blizzards in Vancouver. And so, you know, we're nearby to Vancouver and a lot of planes are coming from Vancouver. So the delays start to happen. The cancellations start to happen. Mm -hmm. We got to the airport and we thought we were good because we were there like a couple hours before the flight and it was still on the board. It was still on time. Oh, dear. And, uh, you know, we went through the check-in process and we got to our gate. And then it was just a sort of a series of announcements about delay, delay, delay. We were there for four hours, and then after announcing all these delays, it's like, oh, sorry, your flight's canceled. Bye. See you later. So question, though, about is it hard to get a, f a, a one-way rental? I mean, because you're not taking the car back. So how does that work? Is it more expensive? Do they let you do it? Does it depend where you're going? Yeah, well, I'll get I'll get to that. Just a couple more things about the, the airport I thought were interesting. So we're standing there waiting at the gate, 
and there's all these announcements for all these flights and they're saying things like, oh, well, the pilot is here, but the crew's not here. They're coming in on a flight from somewhere. And so that's delayed, Ooh. et cetera, et cetera. And there was a flight supposed to be leaving for Saskatoon and, uh, it was minus 35. And so they're like, okay, well, we can't board yet because the plane is too cold. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> and, uh, either they... I don't know what if the the heater on the plane was broken or something, or they I, I'm not sure what, but they said, "Oh, we got to hook up a heat cart to the plane and warm it up before people can get on." And so there's some kind of external heater that they hook up to these planes, and uh, so they kept giving these announcements. It's like, "Oh, okay, well, we can't board until it's 10 Celsius inside the plane, and it's we're up you to know, four Celsius now." My guess is they would have to run the engines on the tarmac yeah. at great expense to heat up the plane. And my guess is also that it would be a slow process to get yeah, it from yeah. minus 30 or whatever it was to room temperature. Yeah. It, so they probably it'd be have like to warming up a car. They'd have to use all this jet fuel to warm it up. So they use these external heaters, I guess. But it was like, okay, well, it's now six degrees inside the plane. We could almost board. Um, you know, I assume that flight was eventually canceled. Six too, degrees Celsius, everything... which is room <laughs> temperatures is about 20. Uh, yeah. Wow. And you know what, but, Brian, a lot of people across the continent are having these, th these problems moved from west to east and yeah. uh, went on after you and, and lots of people listening, I'm sure, are dealing with this. Yeah, and, you know, it, it speaks to clean energy again because, you know, the same things that apply to electric cars versus gas cars apply to, you know, gasoline airplanes and, and yeah. you know. There's advantages in the cold weather to, to gasoline-type fuel, and there's also uh, disadvantages. Well, I imagine if they were electric, they would have got out the uh, combustion heater as well to, to heat it quickly. Yeah, um, or, you know, you just, uh, you know, who knows. But anyway, so they, they canceled our flight and didn't tell us anything about what to do. So we're like, okay, well, we got to scramble and get a hotel nearby. Um, so, you know, we ended up spending two days stuck for two days at the hotel, the Radisson Airport Hotel in Edmonton. And we had booked the flights through a travel agent. So one of the benefits of that is that they have to deal with these problems. Really? You booked through a travel yeah. agent? Yeah. It's just a, like an online travel agent thing. It's not like you're so traveling we, around the world. You're hopping to the next city pretty much. Like, why would you use a travel agent? Uh, it's, it's a perk we have with a, like a points card that we've got and, you know. Okay. So, um, you decided so, to drive instead. Yeah. Well, they, we tried to get them to rebook the flight and the best they could do was December 24th oh, in re trying to rebook. Really? So, which is tomorrow. And they're not paying for this. your hotel, are they? I don't think so. I mean, we're going to get a refund and maybe we'll get a hotel credit or something like that. Um, oh, you know, God. I we couldn't... have like this, you know, passenger rights thing in Canada now. So, you know, they're not supposed to totally be able to screw you over anymore, but <laughs> I don't know. We'll see how that goes. Um, there was one, I just, and when we were finally leaving the hotel on the morning that we left, this lady came into the hotel with her luggage and she said, I'm back. I was at the airport and they canceled my flight again. So I got to check in again. <laughs> That's so, not good. Um, and it's yeah. Christmas. So we were gonna, it's the worst time of year. Because, you know, Christmas, I think yeah. today's like the busiest travel day, you know, yeah. the 23rd, 24th. Busiest, busiest, busiest. Yeah. So uh, we were going to have to spend like, you know, four more days like to waiting for the rebooked flight. So, you know, you, know, you start looking into rental cars and we quickly discovered that everybody was basically outlawing one-way rentals because they would have had no more rental cars left in Edmonton, right? Like, Oh, the yeah, because if the flights are canceled, they're going to be out of cars, I see. Everybody starts calling the car rental places because these are drivable distances for us here in the West. So, mm -hmm. you know, nobody would give us a one-way car rental either. And you try and book online and, you know, same thing, one-way rental, nope, not allowed. So uh, what we ended up doing was we went online to Enterprise and booked a two-week rental for the car. And the idea being that I would drive it back to Edmonton in two weeks. Are you insane? Why? Well, would... what you know? Uh, again, I've got. I'm the retired guy. I've got nothing better to do. <laughs> Jesus, Brian. Really? So, and there was four of us. Like you know, everybody wanted to get back for Christmas and everything. So I thought, well, what the heck? I you know, two weeks from now, I could drive the car back to Edmonton if I had to, hoping that we could work something out where I wouldn't have to do that. You know, we'd we'd. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, we went to pick up the car at Enterprise. We had it booked for 8 a.m. 
And we said, okay, well, this is our plan. We're going to drive it back in two weeks, but we'd rather just drop it in Regina. Is it possible you could, you know, do that? And so they, they fiddled around with the computer and they found a car that they were going to allow that for. There's a bit of an extra charge because what apparently they replate the car, like they put Saskatchewan plates on it once it arrives or, you know. So I think we still kind of lucked out that they found a car that they were willing to let go on the one-way journey. Uh, but maybe there's other people stuck in Regina that need to get to Edmonton. So maybe there's a massive, you know, sort of. Yeah, I think I saw some on the news, <laughs> actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so that's what we did at the airport. They, so, you know, shout out to Enterprise Car Rental. They saved Christmas for us. It was a Christmas <laughs> miracle. I don't have to drive back to Edmonton two weeks from now. They let us do this one-way rental. We did an, an eight-hour drive yesterday and, and made it. Um, and, uh, oh, there was one other thing I wanted to mention about the car rental. When you rent the car on the website, it says, do you want to offset the carbon oh. from your car rental? And it's basically an extra charge. How much do you think they, they charge to offset the carbon on your rental? Is it a one-time fee or a kilometer fee? It's a, just a one-time fee. Uh, $50. No, it was $1.25. <laughs> I don't know. That's one seedling, what, maybe. I guess. I guess. I mean, I guess one seedling is better than nothing. But uh, that seemed uh, that seemed unusually low. But well, why uh, wouldn't it you is something then? just if, if it made you if you believed that if you if you bought into that then yeah that's a great buck twenty five to not yeah. have any emissions. But it is something I want to look into further because I do want to take some flights in the next few years now that I'm retired. And uh, I would like to offset that carbon in uh, in some kind of way, uh, but yeah, that's my long. Uh, wow, long that tail. is uh, something a very. Uh, I wanted you to take a train for part of it, so you'd have a trains, planes, and automobile story yeah. for the rest of your life. You could tell at parties, <laughs> that's you right. know. But uh, apparently, like Vancouver was so much worse. There was one airplane that the people were stuck for thirteen hours on the tarmac. Oh man, that is Vancouver. everyone's worst nightmare, you know. It's like, it's tortured. That's like, should not be allowed. That's No, it shouldn't. I don't think it is allowed. I think they've passed laws against it, no, haven't I, they? Isn't it I like think, two hours, three hours or something? That's the max? Yeah. There's a law. They don't follow it. Um, you know, I heard the passengers had to resort to cannibalism. <laughs> well, it, you start to think that guy looks pretty tasty over there. <laughs> After 13 hours, you've been eyeing him up. Yeah. Well, they, you know, they went through all the like nuts and pretzels on the yeah. airplane. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Ah, uh, that sucks. That sucks. Um, and he, the pilots you'd think would be like, I can't fly now. I've just sat here for 13 hours. I can't fly across yeah. the country for five hours. Come on. That doesn't yeah. seem to work out either. After a couple of hours, you got to just call it and go back to the yeah, gate. Yeah, just if, reason, even they... if you have to board off of one of those little ladder trucks, just get off and, and walk on the tarmac into the I, airport. Yeah. I'm thinking if that ever happens to me, I'll just fake a heart attack or something, and then they'll have to let us <laughs> Fake out. a heart attack. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Stockton and his, uh, his retirement strategies, uh, <laughs> tips so you can make a book one day, fake a heart attack on a plane. Let's yeah. talk about my worries and woes. I have a Prius as our main car right now. I've been trying to replace it with an EV, right? Uh, the Prius is now, like I said, almost six years old. Uh, our five-year lease ran out last spring and I was thinking five years, man, that's too long when we leased it. EVs will be, I'll be wanting to get an EV. Didn't work out because there's just not yeah. enough stock around and Tesla's, yeah. you know, the, the Model slow. 3 was in fact not $35,000 mm -hmm. <laughs> and they've gone up um, ever since in price. So that wasn't doable and the other people didn't follow suit too well. Anyway, um, so I'm still looking for an EV and that's my situation. However, we had a scare with the Prius, a mechanical scare, which I've never had before. Now, we've never had the Prius for more than five years before, but it, nothing has gone wrong. Like nothing, yeah. nothing. Rock solid. Like every little knob and everything, every hook, every cup holder, everything is perfect on those vehicles. And that's why I like them. However, uh, my wife heard a gurgling sound in the cabin a couple of months ago. And so the way a combustion engine works is you have antifreeze that go, circulates through the engine with a water pump. Otherwise, the friction from the way a combustion engine works with pistons rubbing against metal up and down, that it gets too hot. But they use that um, in the cabin 
to heat it. So there's a little radiator yeah. in the cabin and a fan that blows. So that's your waste heat from gasoline being only up to 20 to 27% efficient. Electric cars, of course, are 90% efficient. But you get to use that waste heat. And in an electric car, you need to use 5,000 watts to heat the sucker, you know. Yeah. So uh, I checked the antifreeze reservoir and it was empty. Uh, or empty-ish, and that's a bad thing because uh, that goes into the engine as well. Um, so I, w I was a problem. We had to fill it with antifreeze, and it kept leaking, and there was nothing on the ground. So I looked it up, and, of course, the first thing I find is head gasket gone, and it's yeah, beyond the five-year warranty. Yeah, that happened to me once on, on my Datsun. Oh, well, that's a very old car from yeah. very old times. But did you get it fixed, or did you blow yes, it up for it your film? wasn't crazy expensive when I remember. Well, it's thousands of dollars. <laughs> I looked up $4,000 and I didn't... Uh, uh, the, the only thing that let me sleep at night was the fact that the car is worth so ridiculously much used that we could finally yep. sell it and just turn it over and we wouldn't really lose money on it or anything at all. We'd still gain money for a down payment on a new car, even if it was another Prius. Uh, however, it turns out, and this is a fluke, so in a Prius, there's a catalytic converter. I don't want to get too into the woods here, into the weeds here, rather. But there, the fluid actually goes through the catalytic converter on a Prius. And the reason is, is this is an engineering um, play to uh, increase the fuel economy. So because the catalytic converter is pre full of precious metals, A, people are stealing them, by the way, off of Priuses because they're <laughs> oversized. So they're stealing them <laughs> off of Priuses. And I've seen lots of videos on YouTube of people doing it really quickly. 20 seconds, they steal the sucker. A minute, you know, they pump it up in the middle of the night and it's gone. And it's a lot of money. So hopefully they don't steal mine. My son said it wouldn't be ironic if they stole it just before you got it fixed. <laughs> or just after it got fixed. Anyway, so basically they have to replace the catalytic converter because there's a fluid loop that goes through it. The antifreeze actually runs a fluid loop through the catalytic converter to keep it cool. And without getting too technical, it's because um, they have to change, the combustion cars have to change the mixture of gasoline. They have to over mix the gasoline with the air to cool down the catalytic converter. So there's sensors in your catalytic converter, O2 sensors that keep it temperature sensors to keep it within a certain range. So they have to reduce the fuel economy by increasing the mixture. Well, the Prius doesn't have to do that. It can keep a pretty fine mixture most of the time because it's cooling it in the fluid loop. Another advantage of that is it heats the cabin quicker because the catalytic converter heats up instantly. You don't have to wait for the engine block to heat, which is a big thing. The catalytic converter, the, the smoke, the, the exhaust that goes out of those things, um, you know, heats them up quickly. So then your cabin ostensibly heats up quicker. So that's that's what's leaking, and it's leaking into the gas. The mechanic apparently, after long searches, actually sniffed the gas, <laughs> sniffed the exhaust, <laughs> and said yeah, that it was in there. So, But uh, my wife, and if I was there, I would have said, what are you doing? But she said, is it covered under warranty? And because they they gave her a price of two thousand dollars, and I you know I've got problems with the other car that's I I don't need this. We got a kid going yeah. on a trip, and we were just you know strapped. And I but they said hmm you know it might be. And one guy went to another guy, and another guy went to another guy, and eventually talked to the manager. And the manager said yeah it definitely is. It, we we've had these before wow. uh, because it's part of the hybrid system I guess, which is guaranteed for eight years. Uh, on uh, most cars that have hybrid hmm. systems, they consider this part of the hybrid system. So it's wow. it's guaranteed. Or I, I hope so, anyway. I hope they don't change the What mind. a relief. It would have been a lean <laughs> Christmas, uh, that's for sure. So that's great. And um, speaking of which, um, I had had it on Twitter with you-know-who, and I canceled my Cybertruck reservation. And let's face it, Brian, I, there's no chance. I don't care how long he takes to, to get the Cybertruck out. There's no chance I could afford one. But I've also lost faith in just the fact mm. that the Cybertruck is, is, isn't a stupid idea. Like, I, I don't have faith in him anymore, <laughs> in Mr. Musk. Um, yeah. And maybe it is, but I, I, I'm not, you know, I, I kind of relied on him to, to say that, yeah, this is a good idea, but it could be a complete bust for all I know. It doesn't matter. I have no money to buy the Cybertruck. Um, so it was just wishful thinking, and I took my 150 bucks Canadian back, and I bought a gift for my wife. So 
Yeah, which I will be talking about because it has to do with hydroponic gardening. <laughs> okay, so sure, growing exactly. weeds. Exactly. <laughs> which you could do in Canada. <laughs> uh, also, you know, yeah. you were, we talked a lot about you going to the next city over Saskatoon a lot and there being a Tesla supercharger there for what it is really cold. And by the way, in Denver, it went from plus five Celsius to minus 15, so 20 degrees Celsius in one hour. I mean, that's the homeless people wow. were caught off guard and the, the infrastructure must have frozen. They call that a flash freeze. And that yesterday and the day before, I think it's been happening all across. Uh, but anyway, the, um, the the superchargers in the one city that we, we have between our two major cities where we live went kaput except for one stall with two two cables. Wow. But uh, yeah, this is an issue a lot across all the third party chargers as well. But what happened here? is that someone made a call and they got fixed in a day. They're all working now for Christmas because hmm. people were anxious because a lot of people are going back and forth wow. for Christmas and they need these things to work or they can't make the trip. Well, I would be worried about that too with Tesla being headquartered in California. You would be worried that they maybe not have enough people here Well, they to must have had that. either people who are floating around because there's so many superchargers or their own techs. I don't know if the techs at the shop in yeah. Saskatoon can actually do it, but they fix them instantly. And that's great because everywhere else says, well, wow. we've got to order in parts for two months or six weeks, you know, and, and <laughs> yeah. all these other kinds of chargers. So, <laughs> yeah. And uh, speaking of Denver, uh, out of spec reviews, the YouTube channel that I like, um, because it went down to minus 30, I think last night, he's testing all kinds of things. He's got Teslas, he's got Kias, he's got old Leafs that he's let get cold. And he's char mm -hmm. testing the charging speed and the range because, you know, they don't get to do that. We get this all the time where we live, but Denver doesn't always get yeah, such yeah. an extreme. So he's like using the opportunity. He stayed up all night <laughs> to do this so that he could get, do all these <laughs> tests. And uh, I mean, now he's going to make a fortune off the YouTube content, but... Um, yeah, he'll be able to test it out and we'll see how that goes. He did say that a cold Tesla that's just been sitting there in minus 30, well, it wasn't always minus 30, but could, uh, just sitting there without any heater plugged in, he said it wouldn't charge right away. So it took an hour to sort of get the system going to heat up the battery enough that it would mm -hmm. even start charging. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, you know, batteries charge slower in the winter because they're cold. They can't accept a charge that fast. Yeah. And you can leave your electric car for a few days unplugged if you have to, but you shouldn't. So as we went to Jasper, I left my Tesla plugged into our house, our home charger. You know, I just sort of set the charge level at 50%. So it didn't need to charge while we were gone, but it could always draw from the juice from the uh, the house to, you know, keep the battery warm. Well, this is kind of sad, Brian, because we've always advertised ourselves as the experts on cold weather. You know, because it gets down to minus 40 <laughs> here. So we, the cold weather EV experts of yeah. the worldwide ones, better than Norway, better than Alaska. Yeah. Well, Denver's got some some testing to do yeah. too. Um, but he said that all the Electrify yeah. America chargers were not working. All of them. Because they're only good to a certain all temperature. It's like minus <laughs> 16, minus 20 or something. I, I might have it later in the show. I'll check my notes. But no, they said they, they were... They didn't work. They were they were the only rated to that. So he knew that. <laughs> um, you know, it's minus thirty two or something here today as well, and that's not even including the wind, which is mm -hmm. making it you know ungodly, uh, un uninhabitable. Yeah, we we should not be here. We should be in Hawaii right now. We should be. Oh no, and, this is terrible. Uh, let's yeah. see here. I think um, my Leaf is unplugged. My Nissan Leaf, my electric car, is unplugged because. Uh, for some reason, it charges when it heats the battery. So the battery heater comes on at minus 17 Celsius to minus 20 Celsius, which is quite cold. Um, okay, so it's it comes on and it cycles off at minus 12 once it heats up to minus 12. But for some reason, it it, it can't operate it unless the car is charging. And and that's it's not just my car; it's it's the Leafs. I I, I even assume that the new Leafs because they act pretty much the same way that way. Um, so if you're just leaving your car, then it charges up to a hundred percent, regardless of what you set it to charge to. And of course you don't want to leave an electric car at a hundred percent because that stresses the battery for any length of time. So what mm -hmm. I've, I've been doing, Brian, is I've been unplugging it and plugging it back in because I'm not using it because of the heater 
isn't working. So we use, if yeah. another car is around, I'll just use the Prius or whatever to make shopping trips. So I have um, been unplugging it. So it'll use, it, it could go for, I think, three days heating the battery. Uh, and then I just plug it back in and let it go up again to 100% and then unplug it. And yeah, that's what I have to do. <laughs> Unfortunately, other cars are not like that. But the, the leaf is kind of wonky in that way. And speaking of it, go ahead. And and it's still cold in the leaf no because heater. your heater, the no heater, cabin still looking heater at the diesel broken. heater. It's just uh, it's a sad thing. Okay, it's a sad thing. But I've been I've been managing. <laughs> I did have a hard time the the other day because I could it was frost on the inside of the window. It was like minus twenty eight or something <laughs> Celsius, and I had frost on the inside. Whenever you scrape the frost off, it just falls onto the dash as snow essentially, yeah, it's and then like and snow. that just evaporates in the sun or whatever <laughs> goes right back on the window again if you don't have any heat blowing on it. Um, so I I and in my scraper for some reason the inside of the window doesn't scrape very well. So it's like little lines, I was for scratching little lines in there trying to see and get my daughter at school. But yeah, school is over for now for a while. Anyway, I, I made it. My, my sun-tempered house, my um, house built as a passive solar house, though, um, the other day was minus 32 and the furnace did not have to come on. It was heated above the temperature thanks to the sun just shining in the south windows and the fact that the house is... Decently insulated. Modern houses, I always say uh, when I'm bringing this up, are much more insulated than my passive solar house. Um, but yeah. Yeah. And if you're new to the show, James lives in a, yeah, passive solar, like a two story house that was designed as passive solar, lots of windows facing south, super thick walls, um, you know, based on a design from, I guess, the 1970s here in Saskatchewan. And there was a, you know, a handful of these houses. Uh, built yeah, thanks to the 70s oil together. crisis, uh, they decided to study it in a, yeah. a house called Saskatchewan House, and this was sort of built after that. Um, it skimped out a bit uh, on some of the insulation, but they did things like um, double 2 by 4 uh, offset um, stick construction so that there'd be no thermal bridging. You wouldn't have a direct contact between the indoors and yeah. outdoors and, and that things. And they came up with the, um, the heat exchanger there, the... Uh, for that house, they invented a heat exchanger, which is now used around the world in your house as well. So some updates yeah. to uh, past stories. Um, yeah, the uh, the guy in Denver, the Out of Spec Reviews uh, YouTube channel guy says the new Electrify America BTC charging stations do not work below zero Fahrenheit, which is minus 17. He said, make sure you're not relying on Sounds one of these new stations for the next few days. And these are brand new, Brian. These are brand new and they're not working below that. So that's wow. BS. You've got to give it to Tesla, Brian. If Tesla that's... went completely bonkers, they could be the world's ubiquitous charging network because they got that right, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. No, the charging network is like the uptime. And is they are starting kind of to amazing. open that up to other people. And uh, apparently, when they are broken, someone can get apparently, to them which is not like always quickly. the case with everyone else. So they got to figure that out. Yeah. Wow. Uh, okay. So another update. So we were talking last episode about the fusion energy breakthrough, which we went uh, quite deep into. Uh, but there was a little detail that showed up here on Bloomberg that I just thought was uh, interesting. Um, the laser that they used for this experiment was in the movie Star Trek Into Darkness. They needed a, you know, a location for that movie. <laughs> really? And it was at this, uh, you know, yeah, the National Ignition Facility lab where this uh, laser is that they used for this uh, fusion reaction. Uh, yeah, it's in, the, it's in the movie Star Trek Into Darkness. I when, was what year wild. was that? Was that like 10 years ago? That one is okay. About ten years ago, yeah, it's one think, of the yeah. modern Star Trek movies. But they, the, the laser was around then, and and they, the it's a military operation. I'm surprised they got in and and used it. Yeah, and it's. I, I mean, I possibly my favorite thing about this fusion stuff is that it always does look kind of cool, like these giant. You know, they really look like movie <laughs> yeah. props. They look like movie sets. Yeah. They look like science fiction. Um, you know, it's maybe not practical as an energy source, but not yet. Know, anyway, it's cool. gonna, seems like it's going to be a while. Um, 
So if you are in the United States, and most of you are, we know that, um, who listen to our show, as most shows have a largest audience in the United States, go buy an EV now if you're thinking about buying one, because not right now, but in January 1st or February, um, the first two months or so will get you a tax credit for all brands because um, you're going to have to look into this yourself. But some American built EVs, we just found out, uh, that aren't eligible for the tax credit now, like the Bolt EV, may be able to claim half that credit perhaps when, you know, because they're, they're the, the, the new tax credit says that your EV has to have its minerals sourced in the United States or uh, f countries that it has mm -hmm. free trade with, uh, which is Canada mm -hmm. uh, and a bunch of other countries. And mm, I don't think China counts, but it doesn't. And that's a problem. So if your batteries are built in China, as a lot of them often are, uh, that can be a problem. So... Yeah, check about um, the uh, the EVs that you want to buy, the brand you want to buy, and look into that because the apparently the government just just said that we'll figure it out in March. Not we, we're going to need until March to figure this out to see which EVs, you know, because it's hard to figure out how much of your car comes from the United States and how much of it comes yeah. from outside a free trade zone or something like that. So. So, so is this, this like is an, an interim, interim ruling, ruling that then? The, or what they don't they? even have an exact date, yeah. but uh, if you are looking to buy a car, uh, know that you're probably going to get uh, a better tax credit than you might otherwise get. Now, it might be the same depending on which brand you buy, but, you know, the U.S. automakers are struggling to keep, uh, to get, you know, up to speed on this because they're going to have to shift their supply chains in order to, to make sure that they, uh, some of them may not even try entirely, but... Uh, in order to get the full tax credit, which they're going to want to have, they're going to have to change things around. That's not going to happen overnight. So um, it could be a year or so or you know, longer before you're able to get that same tax break again. So if you're thinking about if you're on the fence, look into that. Yeah, so uh, story here from The Guardian. There's been some concern that um, emissions in the EU might... Uh, go up this year because of, you know, all the problems with uh, Russia and trying to get off Russian gas. And so there have been some coal plants that have been kind of fired up again or in increased their output because of the energy concerns going on in Europe. So there was some concern that the emissions for Europe this year were going to go up, but it turns out they did not. So there was some coal brought online that had not, you know, they weren't expecting to. Uh, but the EU has been doing apparently enough other things with their regulations that uh, overall the emissions still did go down this year, which that is, is great news. news. And this is, you know, the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine changed things around. Um, and still they were able to manage an emissions reduction, which uh, yeah. is very interesting. I mean, we'll have to... I don't think we know exactly why that is. They probably are still looking into that. These things take time, but um, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, we know that the EU has been more strict on things like vehicle emissions. So, you know, presumably all the kind of legislation that they've been working on for the last few years um, is, is well, that, to pay that's off. Well, that's incredible that's if it is, Brian. I mean, that's that's because we we look for that to happen down the road. And if we start to see that, then yeah. that's pretty exciting stuff. And it can be frustrating as, you know, those of us who watch this closely and watch it every day, because, you know, these kinds of agreements get made all the time of, you know, agreements made, rules made to reduce emissions. But, you know, overall, you still kind of see oil use creeping up a lot of the time and it can be discouraging. But, you know, we're trying to get the entire planet to move on all of this. And unfortunately, it, it just takes time. Okay. Well, I have something that tickles my fancy here. Um, it is somebody who drove past a Tesla semi-truck and opened his window and recorded it. So I have the recording for you. And oh, But yeah. you know what it's like to drive okay. by a semi with your window up, right? It's a noisy experience. <laughs> yeah. And this oh, is, I would say... A little above city speed, not quite freeway speed, sort of expressway speed or something like that in the city. Uh, and the start of the recording is the window's down and he opens it immediately so it gets a bit louder. But this is what it sounds like. Uh, 
I mean, that's it. That's that's freaking it. Yeah. Are you shaking? It sounds like nothing. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, there's so many advantages yeah, to we freak- to EVs that are just side advantages. Like, imagine a world where it's not frighteningly noisy. We forget how we just get used to it, right? Like, I, I grew up in a house right near a highway, and you just get used to that awful sound of semi trucks all day and all night. And uh, we don't have to live with that. I live future. near a highway that comes to the end. They live at the edge of the city, so the highway comes to an end, and the semis slow down, and they use their engine brakes, even though the signs tell them there's a fine if you do. Well, guess what? They don't give an F. And those engine brakes are expensive. <laughs> what they do is they use the engine instead of the brake pads to slow the truck down. Yeah. So the it's making the truck like gearing down the engine sort of fight the wheels. It's connected to the wheels, and then the engine's working in reverse or whatever, and it's just fighting the and it's just noisy as heck. Yeah. If the wind is coming from that, and it's hell. Yeah. But you know what? Electric trucks like the Tesla Semi don't have engines to do that. They have regenerative braking, the same things you and I have in our electric cars, which yeah. is great for them. It's great for going down steep grades and not wearing out your brake pads or your engine yeah. because it's, it's you don't have to gear down when you're going down those grades and make a mistake because that's apparently something that happens. That's why you see uh, runoffs for Tesla, for brake runoffs for, for semis. Well, the regenerative braking yeah. just makes more electricity. It makes the motors work in reverse and yeah. make, charges your battery up with your heavy load and is relatively quiet. Well, I drove to Vancouver about two years ago in the early days of the podcast in my Tesla, and I drove through the Rocky Mountains, and I would always watch the regenerative braking when I was going down a mountain and, you know, I had it set to range on the thing and, and the range one time going down a mountain jumped well, up cool. five kilometers. Because, yeah. you know, it probably wasn't five kilometers up the next mountain, you know, like, or something similar. Yeah. I, even in the Prius, <laughs> you can do that. You can watch the regenerative braking work too. So that's cool. Um, now we used to do nice. that in the mountains all the time. So the U.S. Postal Service is, is uh, sort of reversing their course on electrification. Yeah, this is a story we've covered every few months here on the show. Um, Of course, advocates for clean energy have been arguing that uh, the U.S. Postal Service should go hard on electric vehicles. They came out with a very wishy-washy, you know, started out as maybe 20% electric vehicles as they're looking to replace their fleet. They have a gigantic fleet of, of vehicles in the U.S. Postal Service, which, you know, are coming due for replacement. And um, anyway, so they have you know, increased the amount of electric vehicles uh, a little bit over time. And now they have finally given in and gone to 100% uh, electrical purchases for vehicles starting in uh, 2026. So 75% of vehicles in the next few years. And then by 2026, it's going to have to be 100%. That's good. It's a perfect, it's, it'd be stupid. Let's put it this way. It'd be stupid not to. Because, you know, that sort of sector is they have it now. They have the trucks. They have the technology. It's shorter range. Yeah. And it makes financials. You're wasting money if you don't go EV. That's that's the situation we're in when yeah. with small local, tr- short haul trucking, let's call it. So yeah, be stupid yeah. not to. No, and the only issue might be supply of them, but of course everybody's ramping up. And with the Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S., that is encouraging all industry to ramp up production of all kinds of electric vehicles. So uh, I noticed one of the suppliers might be Oshkosh Defense, like a defense contractor. That's kind of weird. Oh, yeah. (laughs) So they're building electric vehicles (laughs) for the post office? Why not like Ford or or somebody else? Well, I mean, if someone gives them a billion dollars. So they recently uh, pledged to go 40% EV, and the new purchase plan gets them to 75% by 2026. Uh, You know, Brian, the the year changes in a couple of days to 2023, and then Mm -hmm. 2026 is going to look awfully close, isn't it? It's going to look pretty close. Yeah, that's right. um, Also change the number on your checks when you're signing checks at the grocery store. As if you do that. Right. So <laughs> checks that I... When was the last time you wrote a check? Constantly. You probably have. I haven't. 
<laughs> really? Uh, two hours okay, ago. We won't Long get into it. Yeah. So we've been talking about solar farms <laughs> on uh, formal coal plants, which is cool because what they do is they use the infrastructure that's there because you have a, a coal power plant, you need to build a whole bunch of power transformers and power lines to connect to the rest of the grid. So it's kind of convenient to do that. Well, I found an example of where they're doing it on an abandoned nuclear power plant. The site of the project is the Rancho Seco, a former uh, SMUD nuclear facility that was taken offline in 1989 after a series of troublesome incidents and a vote of no confidence mm. from the public. So the public basically had had enough and said <laughs> no. And they shut the sucker down, which is okay. seems inconceivable now. Well, 1989, that was the year The Simpsons started, so maybe that had something to do with it. You know, I've seen videos where they talk about The Simpsons has not helped the, the nuclear uh, industry. I've actually, the people actually think <laughs> about that, I, and I, I didn't. I, yeah. But, you know, three-eyed fish and all that. So the 2,000-acre site was eventually yeah. repurposed for the uh, Consumes Natural Gas Power Plant, which is still there. But they also now have added 1,000 megawatts of, uh, pardon me, 160 megawatts of solar uh, in addition to the 1,000 megawatts of natural gas. So, yeah, very interesting. And, and why not? Uh, you have the, the, the property. Yeah. And apparently there was some property there to, to put all this stuff up. So why not? Why not add solar and, and make mm -hmm. use of the utility? No, we need grid connections for all this clean energy, and they often already well, exist. Well, let's get into some of our main stories of the show before, before you know, the new year happens. And we may have a New Year's countdown if we yes. keep going long on the show, but let's go. <laughs> hey, it's the year-end spectacular. We're going long. Uh, so this is a story from Electric Autonomy Canada. Study shows EV's potential to increase utility revenues but reduce customer costs. So this is a study that happened in California. And basically the gist of this is that, uh, particularly in California, there are lots of electric vehicles now. So basically electric, electricity consumption has gone up, like this is a, a natural thing. But utilities in California and here in Canada, most places are, are heavily regulated, like they are, operate often as a monopoly. So since they're a monopoly, you know, you don't want to let them just charge whatever rates they want. If, you know, if it was a true monopoly, they could just charge $5 a kilowatt hour and just make all the money in the world because they're, you know, uh, um, a, a regulated monopoly. They're the only ones licensed to sell power. But because of that, um, regulations exist so that they can't just take all the money they want from the customers. They have to uh, play fair as a monopoly. So basically, as consumption goes up, the prices have to come down because the utilities are only allowed to make so much profit. So it's really the first glimpse of the future that we are eventually going to see of really abundant clean energy and the prices starting to come down. This is a somewhat artificial price is starting to come down because it's more from the regulations than from, from anything. But um, it's, it's a glimpse of the future. The more um, electricity is made, the more money the utilities make and, you know, the less well, they have to charge. Uh, an interesting study. Um, yeah. Where was that uh, study? Electric Autonomy um, Canada. Electric Autonomy Canada is the website and uh, the report is called Electric Vehicles Are Driving Rates Down. And it's uh, a study that looked at three uh, California Very interesting utilities. stuff. So Google that if you want to know more. Uh, Toyota, or pardon me, Toyota, Tokyo mandates rooftop solar. This is interesting <laughs> because Japan has kind of poo-pooed solar and wind. They should have been on top of this a long time ago, and they're only now doing it. And, you know, uh, nuclear has been uh, shut down for many years now since the Fukushima disaster, uh, and they shut down a lot of their nuclear. Uh -huh. You'd think they would have just hopped on the renewables right away, but they haven't. Uh, but now they're really starting to come on board. The Tokyo Metropolitan Assembly has approved new provisions to make solar installations mandatory for new homes. The rules apply to homes with total rooftop areas of more than 20 square meters and to buildings with rooftops smaller than 2,000 square meters. So some other buildings too that aren't homes. They will also require businesses to install solar arrays on 30% of the rooftop surfaces. 
Some parts of the city could face requirements for 85% of all rooftops to be covered by PV. So that's, that's pretty significant. The new rules will require developers and installers to use solar panels from manufacturers that respect human rights too. So there's, there's some, there's some rules in there that you can't just buy any, any solar panels. <laughs> and, uh, Japan is not a solar panel manufacturer to my knowledge. So I'm not sure, uh, if that means not China or, or what that means exactly. Cause I haven't heard about solar panels coming from, um, a place that doesn't respect human rights aside from China, which is quite obvious and arguable. We seem to put up with it because half our stuff comes from China and three quarters of our stuff. Yeah. Yeah, no, we've got all these rooftops all over the world. Um, they eventually will have all kinds of solar on them, and that will lead to the kind of abundance that we are planning for and hoping for that will uh, make electricity even This is for future. new homes, okay, not existing homes. But, you know, we're kind of at a threshold now where if you're building something, you might as well include the solar because it's probably a bit cheaper to the factor the solar in when you're building a home the wiring and everything is already pre-done yeah. and and uh accommodating for the solar and why not i mean yeah you're you're outlaying a bit more money it's mm -hmm. kind of like adding you know five percent to super insulate but then you save that five percent in as a short period of time to that pays for that mm -hmm. and it could be an, a, a few years yeah. it could be less <laughs> I lied, Brian. It's not time for the lightning round. The time for the lightning round was an hour ago. It was ages ago. Look, it's, it was yesterday. It's the year end spectacular. We're going long. Yes. Well, this is our how we end the shows. We do it with a fast paced look at the week and clean energy and climate news. So let's not dawdle. The new year is coming. Electric says um, Tesla make a pack. The country's utility scale energy storage battery system could be sold out for almost the next two years, according to Tesla's own timeline. A single megapack unit is a container size, so a shipping container sized um, three megawatt hour battery system with integrated modules, inverters, and thermal systems. What do you think? Yeah, well, you know, everyone's scaling up battery production, but the thirst for batteries is so huge that, uh, yeah, there's going to be still shortages of batteries for the next few years. Headline, climate negligence bill could let New Yorkers sue fossil fuel companies. And this, Brian, is hilarious. Let me get to it. The uh, climate bill negligence bill, the climate negligence bill will allow private New Yorkers to sue, to sue. I'm, I've run out of steam myself. <laughs> I'm not going to make it to the end. The climate negligence bill, which will allow private New Yorkers to sue fossil fuel companies for climate damages is modeled after, get this, sit down for this one, the Texas abortion law. Okay. This is how they decided to fight abortion in Texas to let people sue. If you knew somebody, you could sue them for getting an abortion yeah. or giving them abortion services. Well, they modeled it after that, but for a good reason, for the climate. Uh, Texas controversial 2021 law by state Republican lawmakers empowered private citizens to sue people who aid and abet an abortion. The Supreme Court declined to block the law. And guess what? Ha ha, Supreme Court. Your thinking is now going to do something good for the world. And I know you don't like good things. There is uh, public support for fossil fuel companies to be held responsible for damages caused by climate change. And I know you like suing fossil fuels. But... Yeah, no, uh, challenging them in the courts has been a great thing. It's been very effective in certain cases. Um, I've mentioned before, there's a great podcast called What Roman Mars Can Learn About Con Law. And they talk about some of these kinds of issues. The, you know, decisions lately of the Supreme Court in the U.S., they've really gone against precedent. They've gone against, you know, the history of the court. It's been a very weird turn to the court. But, uh, you know, this is, they've now established these new precedents. And it turns out these new precedents can be used for things like what you just talked about. <laughs> and speaking of creative litigation, 16 manip municipalities in Puerto Rico are using the same racketeering legislation used to bring down mob bosses and fraudsters against oil and coal companies, which is basically the same thing. Yeah. 
uh, accusing them of conspiring to deceive the public for decades over the climate crisis. Good for them. If that's not racketeering, I don't know what is. <laughs> the richest people in the UK use more energy flying than the poorest do overall, according to Carbon Brief, who reported on this study. So, yeah, they're just the rich people flying. One rich person flying. Mm -hmm. Uses more than a poor person does in a whole year yeah. just for their flying. And I feel like it's probably worse here. I think where we live, we you know the the highest carbon footprint per person is probably where James and I live. Well, it's time for a clean energy show fast fact. Amazon produced enough plastic packaging in 2021 <laughs> to wrap the Earth more than 800 <laughs> times in air pillows. That is from an Oceana report quoted in EcoWatch. 800 times wrapped the entire planet in a pillow wrap. Yeah, so Amazon, of course, you know, they've got the Climate Pledge Arena in uh, Seattle. Amazon is trying to go all electric with their delivery vehicles. Um, but it's a difficult business to try and, you know, make eco-friendly. Yeah. It is with the flights. I mean, I, I live in a place where well, we live in a place. <laughs> you live in the same place. Uh, all the flights from Memphis and the other hub, the, the you know, the shipping hubs, they fly over our house, Brian, yeah. every day. If I'm sitting sunning my ass in the pool in the summertime and I look up, I see all these 747s going to China via Anchorage uh -huh. where they refuel. It's cheaper to stop and refuel than it is to carry the full load of fuel. It's constant. It's just constant. If you look at the flight tracking software, it's it's nonstop. Yeah. The flight's coming back and forth. Uh, it's a great year for solar generation in the EU in 2022. Guess what? It's up 47% vis the year before. Wow. And it's a record-breaking 41.4 gigawatts expected to hit 60 in the, the coming year. So that's the, another 50% gain. That's uh, It's on fire so to speak. Top five countries, Germany, eight gigawatts. And, you know, Germany's a cloudy country, much cloudier than most of North America. Spain came in second, a close second, and Poland, the Netherlands, and France was down at about 2.7. They're starting to catch up. Ars Technica, Porsche's synthetic gasoline factory is coming online this week in Chile. The, um, Plant will scale up from 34,000 gallons to 14.5 million gallons by 2024. Now, right now, most of this is going to be used in Porsche's racing car, um, you know, just so they can have race car events with Porsches that have, you know, sustainable fuel, supposedly. Interesting. And that, Synthetic. that's a lot of, uh, they need that much fuel for racing cars? Well, Porsche is very, <laughs> apparently, probably, um, you know, because they train and they, they do all the, there's probably lots of different racing car series. So this is, um, you know, the Porsche wants to keep combustion engines going. And I, I understand that, you know, in a world where everything's an EV, you might want a, a Porsche. Some people will like a combustion engine. They'll, there'll be a fancy for yeah. that. And. Uh, this is one way that they see of getting around it is we're using synthetic gasoline that is sustainably produced. So the U.S. Uh, deployed 5.19 gigawatt hours or 1.44 gigawatt energy storage last year. 91% was on the grid. The rest would be in people's homes and businesses. In, well, no, this is not last year. This is Q3 of 2022. Uh, close to half the entire amount of storage installed in 2021. Uh, so half and one quarter of the previous year. So that's pretty cool. California and Texas accounted for almost all of it. Wow. So Texas is, you know, there's a lot of green energy in Texas, even though the politicians go around blaming falsely still to this day mm. uh, for power outages. EU natural gas prices have fallen by close to 40% over the last week. Wow. So that they are now nearly back to the level before the Russian invasion. I think it's because uh, the weather hasn't gone crazy yet there. But if you get our bomb cyclone moving, look out because it's going to get cold. We're almost done the show, Brian. GM crews of robo-taxis have started service in Tesla's Austin, Texas. Uh, so now the people in Austin, including what's his name, are going to see uh, robo-taxis driving around and doing what FSD is nowhere near being able to do. So that's interesting. Uh, by the way, we'll end the show this week on this good news story. An F-150 Lightning, that's the all-electric Ford pickup truck, 
that was at a dealership in California that lost its power due to a major earthquake kept the whole stinking business going. In fact, they had three cars on the lot, three used, a couple of other used EVs. They all had them going. Mm -hmm. The Ford can output lots of electricity via their outlets. And they kept, you know, they said on Facebook, we're open for business. This is a picture of our Ford powering our business. The cashier registers are going. If you want parts, the lights are on, come on down. So that is really cool. And it's one of those major things. Yeah, right? no, they have all EVs. kinds of outlets in the back for um, powering a dealership, but, you know, usually a work site. Well, that is more than our time for this year. If you are listening to us before the holidays, we want to wish you a happy holiday if you celebrate in any way, or even if you don't and you're using the time off to get together with family and friends, we wish you the best. And as always, you know, by call us, email us, cleanenergyshow.gmail.com. Check us out. Uh, thanks to all who have donated in the past week. We continue to receive uh, donations for people buying us coffee. There's a link in the show notes if you ever want to do that. And so grateful to the people who have. If you're new to the show, remember to subscribe on your podcast app so you want to get new episodes. Big, big show, our biggest in history, Brian. Uh, Happy New Year to you and Merry Christmas and all that and uh, to our listeners as well. Yeah, thanks everybody and we'll see you next year.